Peace. This is the Ask Your Old Head Podcast with Justice Raji. Before we get into this week's very, very special episode, I want to give a, a little, little context. Uh, so earlier this month, I was fortunate enough to travel to the Black Communities Conference in Durham, North Carolina, and be on a panel uh, representing my work uh, for, and, 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 and also collaborating with some of my good brothers, the panelists, or the, the author of the panel that got put together and sharing the ways we are trying to approach the issues facing our community from the different disciplines that we all work in. And um, it was really rewarding. It was a great conference. Uh, I really learned a lot. And I'm excited for an opportunity to return to Durham or nearby environs if that's where it takes place uh, sometime in the future. And also inspired to think about maybe having a black community conference in uh, my neck like of the woods. And we'll, we'll, we'll see about that. Uh, but the very important thing, and, and it is the, the centerpiece of this interview you're about to listen to with my guest, Larry Lane is the importance of seeing uh, black people in more than the context that you're most familiar with. Uh, say it was the prevailing um, thought that I left that trip and that conference with. So uh, I think you maybe in the near within this month, I'm going to actually just do a sit down you know, brain dump on some of my thoughts of spending the time I did in Durham and thinking about the context of that area um, as it relates to my own life, but also to you know, certain aspects of the black experience. Um, and as always with this podcast, the development um, and the self-development of black men. So um, we'll check in on that in the near future. So I'm not going to give too much more uh, pre-talk to my guest today, but I'm going to say simply, uh, you know, the essential concepts of what this podcast is all about uh, and why I started to work on this, I think, uh, is exhibited in what my guest is about to share. Um, there could, there's nothing uh, that can replace the value of, of family love and brotherhood and in really existing in community and um, you know sometimes you may read if you see my social media posts or other things you know certain hashtags that me and some of my, my brothers share specifically ones around the pedigree and being born in not sworn in and um, that's a root idea that I'm not going to explain in full here, but I hope that you could make the connection as you sit through this interview and, and, and tune in to what me and uh, my good brother, um, my elder, one of my old heads, uh, you know, pops, I guess you have to say. Um, we always say, we often talk about, uh, you know, your brother from another mother. I mean, it don't rhyme as well, but your brother from another father is also right up there. So, uh, listen, Joy, uh, please feel free to add on and share your comments, you know, on the social media, what have you. And um, we're going to go ahead and get into this, sit down with my my, my man, North Philly's own, Strawberry Mansion's own, Larry Lane. Please tune in. Peace. Peace. This is the Ask Your Old Head podcast with Justice Rod G. Um, Joined by my guest, Larry Lane. Larry Lane. Uh, so we're just gonna get into it. Uh, is there anybody before we get started you just want to give some reverence or uh, some love and respect to? Well, uh, I'd like to to my family, to my son, to my nephew, to my grandchildren, nieces and nephews. I give all of them, and I come with love and peace be unto you. Um, I give reverence and reference to uh, my elders, 
those that had a part in me becoming who I am mm-hmm. um, in different ways in my life, different times in my life. Um, they gave me values and helped build character uh, as I go forward. Hey, thank you. So we'll just get into it. Uh, so what's a, a standard or a principle, something that you practice um, or do or try to do as you move through the world? Well, I try to draw from my life experiences, and I try to use them as a standard, and I reach back and I try to use have thought for them in decisions that I make, mm-hmm. and trying not to be a reactionary, but try to be proactive in the way that I live my life. And much of that comes from... Uh, I guess, of the way that I grew up. My father died when I was seven years old. And um, my father at that time was working as a radiologist. We were talking about back in the early 50s and attending University of Pennsylvania in a pre-med course. Um, We had just moved into an integrated community. He was a veteran. We had moved in using the GI Bill. We had moved into an integrated community, mostly a Jewish community in Philadelphia. Um, Mm -hmm. But it began being much more of a working class. A number of working class uh, black folks were moving in with the Jewish community. And on my block, we had teachers. We had principals. We had people who worked at uh, Campbell Soup and RCA Mm -hmm. in Philadelphia, which were very good jobs at that time. Had people who worked as uh, um, security in the court systems. We, you know, you had this, these were um, professional working class black folks in the community that I lived in. And so those were the people who I saw. And those were the people who were my neighbors. And those were the people who I, I drew from. But by him dying when I was seven years old. Mm-hmm. As I got older, by the time I was 10 or 11, I would go south to my family's home every summer. And they were farmers. Mm-hmm. And I learned how hard work it was for them to farm. They farmed tobacco in North Carolina. Mm-hmm. And I can do everything except for set out the plants in tobacco. I know how to, to crop it, how to hand it, how to um, truck it from the field to the barns, how to, how to take it out of the barns, how to hang it in the barns, how to um, prepare it for market. Um, I learned everything about that because that was the work that my family did. Um, they were very religious. Um, Saturday was the time that you went to town. And Sunday, every Sunday, you were at some church. Um, and so the, the values of God, religion, Hard work and humbleness mm. is all part of uh, who I think I have become because of those are things that were instilled in me. Word. Wow, that's you gave a lot there. Um, within that, um, was there a particular understanding of hard work? Um, if there's any particular story or something you could share, how you came to understand the importance of hard work? Well, living in the South um, and being a a child that was a product of city, country, city, um, in the summers, you know, if you're in the South and you're living on a working farm, you eat, you sleep, you work. Mm. Everyone has some function, some job to do on a farm. Um, you were up at daybreak. Uh, there was my people at that time, they were still farming using mules. So you had to catch the mules in the morning. So even as a young guy, I was with my own, one of my uncles catching, uh, catching the mules and preparing them to work for the day. While one of my aunts was in the kitchen uh, preparing food, uh, breakfast, which was a very important meal before you went to the fields. My other uncle was preparing to go to town to pick up help that would help them uh, on the farm, but he would also feed them breakfast in the morning once he picked them up before we went to the fields. So um, hard work and, you know, every day at 12 o'clock, 
Mm-hmm. You know, you, you would hear the sirens that would go off at the uh, firehouse in the distance to let you know it was 12 o'clock and everybody would come from the fields. Um, people that helped us and lived in close, pro- close proximity would go to their own homes for, for what they call dinner, lunch, what we now call lunch midday. Mm-hmm. It was called dinner then. Oh, wow. And uh, you would go and you you dinner, you'd have that time of day and you come back and you go back to the fields and you'd work to a reasonable hour or finish the work of that day and uh, you know it, none of this work was easy you were in the sun you were in the dew in the morning you were wet with dew in the morning in the fields you would dry off in the sun you they'd stop during midday you'd have a Pepsi and peanuts mm-hmm. and I grown to, as I got a daughter I understood that Back then, you having a Pepsi or a Coke or a Dr Pepper and peanuts, you were getting that that uh, yes. that sugar rush, yeah, you know, sugar, and you were protein. getting that peanut uh, a protein. Yeah. Or people were eating uh, what they call nabs, which are peanut butter crackers. But that's what you're eating because that was helping you sustain yourself in that hard work that you were actually doing. So I learned what hard work was by watching those, and then at a young age participating in that type of work. Hmm. I'm gonna hold a thought and I'm gonna return to it in a minute and we'll get to this second question. So um relationships broadly defined, um, is there something you understand now in life about relationships um that you may have understood differently or practiced differently as a younger man? As you mature, as I have matured, I realize that family is the most important thing that you probably have. If you cultivate those relationships, um, you have families that are not close, you have families that are distant because someone has done something in a family that creates a problem that other family members have with that person. You may not have them, but it's a family problem. Um, I understand that relationships are one of the most important things that you can have in life, whether it's your blood relationships or whether it is relationships that you cultivate by those that are around you that become your family. I guess you would call it your extended family. Um, Those are the most important things you can have because those will be there when all other things are against you, when other problems are seem insurmountable, um, those are there. And being a black man, you know, growing up, being who I am, you know, you, you didn't have a psychiatrist to go to. Mm-hmm. You didn't have a psychologist to go and talk to. You had to talk to someone else that understood you and tried to figure out your problems by someone else who knew you and understood you and would give you the best advice that they could at that time. Mm-hmm. Um, so uh, hopefully you always you were talking to someone who knew as much or more than you, not talking to someone who less knew less than you mm-hmm. and trying to incorporate that into the advice that you're taking. Mm-hmm. Um, so, yes, relationships um, wind up being very, very important in life um, and how you use them, how you cherish those are very important. All right. Um, so something I want to give give you a little reference while we hear about is um, because you said you spoke to the idea of cultivating that relationship and um, something um, you know full disclosure to the to the listening audience. You know, you are the a father to my closest friend in the world, um, and the overwhelming thing I remember first meeting you was sort of a, uh, almost an invitation, right? That, like, your son brought me to meet you, so are uh, you down with us now, right? In that sense of, all right, if you were mine, I'm, I'm going to welcome you in, right? Now, I'm, I'm sure maybe if I had behaved differently, once I was welcomed into the fold, I may have been asked to leave <laughs> the <laughs> fold. <laughs> However, is there uh, something you could speak to around just either, like, how you... You know, how did you come to that understanding of even how to engage, uh, you know, a young man like myself or, or, or others? Like, is that something that, you know, how did you get there? With that? 
Well, a, a joy to me has been that my son has identified and uh, developed the type of friendship and relationships in his life that I've had in my life. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, uh, as we get older, I might say that people that are on my squad mm-hmm. or people that are in my crew, but those people that are in my squad and my crew are people that I grew up with as children or people who I've had long-term relationships with. And now your son, my son, and you have over 20-year relationships together. Mm-hmm. Um, y'all are squad. Y'all are the same crew. Um, but it, 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 it's you looking, into a, looking at a person and looking into their soul, looking into their being. Look at how they handle themselves. Look at their values. And then you gain respect for that, and you gain respect for them. And then you take them as belong to me because now, you know, you belong to me also. Um, You're my son. Mm -hmm. He's my blood son, but you're also my son. Um, And those are relationships that come by trust, by understanding, and by respect. Mm -hmm. I mean, how... To me, I think this is, um, I think it's a vital, important thing in understanding black men, that folks understand how important whatever their, their, their circle of trust, um, we're, we're um, on the pod side, hopefully that, that circle is healthy, but sometimes maybe that circle is not so healthy, but that's still that circle, right? So if you're going to serve or you're going to connect with that man, you got you to gotta balance that. Um, at least as I see it, you can you will may not be successful engaging that person if you make their circle an oppositional uh, reality. Um, is there anything that you would want to give or share with someone around how to develop? You know, what I'm saying a relationship or, or or their own circle, or even to look at their circle. You know what I mean, what is there something that you've learned from your experience managing the way people show up sometimes in your life? Well, it has to be based on common interests and um, common values. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I've I'm now in retirement and before retirement, but now especially in retirement, I do a lot of travel. I travel internationally quite a bit. But the people who I travel with are people who I've had relationships with for over 40 years. Mm-hmm. You can't travel with everyone. You can't, just as when you go to college, you can't live in a room with everyone. Mm-hmm. Uh, you, you develop those friendships. You develop those abilities to travel. Uh, many people ask when we may be on a trip, and uh, uh, one of my travel partners, he may go out at night with the people we're traveling with uh, to have wine or that sort of thing. Well, that night I didn't want to have wine. I wanted to go to the room. I wanted to read the local newspaper or look at the local news, even if we're in Zimbabwe. Mm -hmm. I want to look at CNN or look and listen to some local news or read local papers to see what's going on in those communities. Mm -hmm. And and people have come back to me and laughed and said, he said, y'all do what y'all want to do. Yeah, because we're together, but he may go one direction, I do go in another direction, but we're both seeking information. Mm -hmm. We're both seeking what's going on and what the lay of the land is. And then we have things to share. I'm going to give you an example. We were in Johannesburg in South Africa. I retreated to the room and was seeing what was going on uh, in the area. He went out with some people. We realized when we got to these hotels that we were inside of a gated community mm-hmm. with inside of Johannesburg. Now, that kind of put a little difference to us, like what's going on when we see that we're inside of gates that are going to be closed at night, Um, not just for the hotel, but for the entire community. Mm -hmm. So when he came back to the room, I told him, don't leave out of here again without having your room key. And he's like, what are you talking about? Now, this is a guy who's retired from the military who's my travel partner, Mm -hmm. and he's one of the ones when he went in the military and came home and told me, don't you go in the military, because if you go in the military with your attitude, he was older than me, (laughs) you're going to jail. And I never went in the military. 
<laughs> but he come back. I got my pages traveled all over the world. Mm-hmm. Um, um, uh, uh, after coming out of active duty as a reservist, Air Force reservist, and that's sort of in the Middle East and everything. Mm-hmm. He said, I got my passport. We, I said, no, because your passport doesn't mean anything once we came inside of those gates. You have to have your room key to show that you are authorized to be inside of those gates, whether yeah. you have a passport or not. I only found that out by me going to the room, reading the material, reading the material on the room keys mm. that that related. Without that, we wouldn't have known that kind of information. But right. those type of things that you share with someone as you're moving around traveling, which is different than you just accepting what's what's there. So Yeah, indeed. I think um, I saw your face when I talked about being inside a gated community. Yeah. inside of yeah, there's uh, so many implications there. Yes, man. there like, are, <laughs> and and that was one of our problems. That if if it goes down the night, we locked inside the people inside the gate, so we the enemy. <laughs> right. We, <laughs> we might. Be, I don't necessarily want to be with them. I'm no, just, that's right. Hold up. If but I that was get, part of our travel group. Yeah. <laughs> Well, I think that, I mean, I think you highlighted something that maybe I want to dive into for a second. As as someone that has traveled and as a black man of, 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 of a senior age, because um, there's, there is a big thing among young people now, young black people like um, younger than me, of like, I travel, I go overseas. I'm, you know what I mean? There's a lot of pictures of people at the beach, which I don't begrudge you if you like beaches. I mean, beaches are cool and all. Um, but there there is a... I think a good thing, a positive energy around like getting out of the United States, which I think when I was younger uh, was definitely something that was like certain people said to do, but it wasn't popular. Like it maybe go to Mexico, like go somewhere totally recreational, but to like, a resort. Yeah, to go to a resort, but like really being like, I'm gonna go to West Africa, I'm gonna go to Europe, I'm gonna go to Japan, was not like everybody black wasn't really with that. Um, not that everybody black is now, but. Is there something else that you could share about um, what you've learned getting to travel, especially outside the States? Well, well, international travel opens your eyes to many, many different things. Um, I haven't traveled nearly as extensively as I plan to, Mm -hmm. but I'm traveling as much as I can while I can. And that's one of my slogans, Mm. for me to travel as much as I can while I can, because I know there's another day coming. Um, If I'm blessed to live to October 3rd of this year, which is a little less than a month from now, I'll be 70 years old. And I want to try to travel for as long as I can in those 70 years, continue to travel. Um. At this point, I've been to Egypt. Mm -hmm. I've been to Senegal, West Africa. I've been to Ghana, West Africa. I've been to Benin. I've been to Togo. I've been to Zimbabwe. I've been to South Africa. Um, I've been to Cuba Um, and throughout the Caribbean. Each one of those places that I've visited all have something different to offer when you see the people in those cultures, and especially those cultures that are governed by people who look like you, Mm. look like me and you, Mm -hmm. because I've seen you in Egypt. You look like a lot of Egyptians that I've seen. Mm -hmm. Um, I look like a number of people that I've seen in Ghana and seen in, 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 in lower Egypt. Um, well, no, they call that, we call, yeah, Upper, Upper Egypt. Egypt indeed. Uh, so, and looking back at the United States from outside gives you a different perspective of where you're from. Um, this country looks much different from outside than it does inside, even if you try to have an outside perspective. Mm-hmm. Um the, the world is much different other places. Many things that we take for granted here are not to be taken for granted other places. One thing for sure is that the whole middle class concept is a concept that was created by America. The middle class does not exist everywhere. Mm-hmm. There are have and have nots. There are a lot more have nots than there are haves. Mm-hmm. Um, 
when I hear the reigning president of the United States talk about shithole countries, he's talking about majority of the world. And not just people of color, but having the infrastructure that people are not defecating in a hole somewhere and it being buried is something that exists all over the world. Whether it be in Bosnia, whether it be in West Africa, Mm -hmm. whether it be in Brazil, whether it be many different places, the whole infrastructure that you you know and you grow grown to exist in the United States does not exist everywhere else. Many places you're not going to see a water fountain after you leave the airport, unless you're in a few certain hotels in a country. Mm. You you know one of the major things in a lot of countries, the first thing that people have to do in the morning is try to find water and charcoal or firewood mm-hmm. because. Everyone doesn't have running water in their building. You drink, you get up in a hotel and you go and you take a shower. Well, that's not what exists in the majority, large part of the world. You know, you you get up and you think about having a coffee maker in your hotel room. That's not what exists in a large part of the world. There are things that you take for granted that are not to be taken for granted. That's why everyone is trying to get to America. Mm-hmm. And those that get here don't want to leave. Only a few come here, get education, and go back to where they come from. But even those con- continually do transatlantic or transpacific trips mm-hmm. to get backwards and forwards to America. Um, come November, as a gift to myself for my 70th birthday, uh, November I plan to go to China. Because Chinese are people of color also. And if you study and you go back to some of the studies of Dr. Gates, he'll tell you about the African influence in China Mm. and just how in certain regions of China, they're darker skinned people. If you look at Southeast Asians, you look at the Cambodians, the Laotians, they're all darker skinned people. Mm -hmm. Um, So they're a large part of um, China is Islamic. Mm -hmm. And there's a whole thing going on there now about the suppression of Islamic people. Yeah, the so there's a lot of things to see um, traveling out of this country and looking at this country from the outside as well as what you see from the inside. Mm. All right. I think you put a good, good, good table on that one. So I'm going to come back and we'll circle. Uh, so third question, what is right now... Just man, you took you. me so far. That's the only third question. Here hey, man, that's how we do it. Here we go. Here we go. Here we go, <laughs> man. <laughs> What's something that's really uh, just really important to you right now? Like where you at? Like, where I'm at right now uh, is my individual growth. As I said, me traveling and, and experiencing things. But I know that at 70 years old, I'm closer to the end than I am the beginning. Mm-hmm. So while I was, I'm interested in my own individual growth. I'm interested in the growth of you, my sons, Mm -hmm. my nieces, my nephews, and trying to see and and having the joy of experience of of y'all being uh, uh, contributing members of this world and society as a whole and for the growth that you can spread to this world because everyone doesn't have the same type of thought. Everyone doesn't have the same type of interest. But being contributing members to this world is very, very important. Um, People take a lot of different directions. People that you know, people that you may have went to kindergarten with or may have been different directions. I have friends younger than me now that I, one in particular, who I just visited a couple weeks ago, which one bad day in his life, has took him from being a professional athlete to now has spent four, over 40 years mm-hmm. in a penitentiary for one bad day in his life. Good guy, great athlete, but now he's serving a life sentence in a penitentiary in which I'm trying to see if it's something I can do to help him in reversing the laws in Pennsylvania, which means life is your total life, mm-hmm. which means when you're convicted of a crime, no matter what you've done over 40 or 50 years, means that they bring you out in a box. You had no chance to reclaim any type of life in society 
for your repentance or anything else. So, um, knowing that and seeing that and seeing that I share with a lot of young people when I go and talk to schools Mm -hmm. about how one bad decision can change your entire life. Um, One of the things that I told Majestic when he left to go to school and went to Pittsburgh, Mm -hmm. and I reinforced again with his cousin when he came to Pittsburgh to go to school, was no means no. If a woman, if a girl tells you no, even if it's the faintest of no, it means no, because that one mistake can, with all of the different people that I may know or relationships I may have or lawyers I may know or people in different political, I may not be able to help you. Mm -hmm. And if you get that in your record, you may never be able to help yourself because you may say you didn't hear no, but no was said. Yes, sir. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, and I hope you're teaching that to your son. Absolutely. Because he's a good looking guy. No, oh, thank you. <laughs> we try. I mean, that, well, I won't get into that right now. <laughs> the things I've had to educate him on and prepare him for. But um, uh, so we had this stage where I'm going to spin us open a little bit and then we'll, we'll find our, our, our landing point. Because um, you brought up a couple big things and I want to circle back um, to where we started. Because um, you spoke about growing up bet- with your life in, in, in Philly. In North Philly, specifically, right? Yes, North Philly. Yes, Strawberry and Mansion. Strawberry Mansion, as, as, as it's known. Um, and your life here in Durham and how those worlds were connected. Right? Mm-hmm. Those That's not a disconnected world. No. Um, and I feel like in this time, for many of us, we're either in that world or we're in this world. We're not in both of these worlds anymore. Um, and do you think, what do you think has been lost due to that not, being there anymore a a lot has been lost by uh african-american families having a disconnect with southern roots Mm -hmm. um when we with the great migration and us moving north for jobs and opportunities and leaving farms and leaving uh, uh uh the same ravages of slavery which you were just slaves to a farm or slaves to uh, uh, being arrested and put on in a penitentiary and doing slave labor and all the things that uh, are talked about, like in the book, new, the new, new Jim Crow and that sort of thing. There's a disconnect with people who lived off the soil and people who lived in the cities. So I feel a very big connect of who I am is that city, country, city, because I got values from both places. Mm-hmm. Um, My mother's family was from Durham, North Carolina, but they lived outside of the city Mm -hmm. on on a farm. My father's family was in Goldsboro, uh, or Wilson and Goldsboro, North Carolina, and they lived on a farm. And I grew up in North Philadelphia uh, in a black and Jewish neighborhood. Mm -hmm. Um, I've benefited greatly by being able to view all of those things and put them into a context, and I try to share that through who I am, and share that with other people. I find people who grew up in the South and grew up on tobacco farms or pulling cotton or picking cotton or pulling corn, they don't want to relate to that part of their background. And only when I search them out and I show them that I know something about the background that they've had as child children, do they come in and say, oh, how do you know about that? Because they don't want to claim that. Many people of my age are ashamed of their background. They're ashamed that they experienced that. When I look at it as a growth, not as something to be ashamed of. Yeah. Now, to be very honest with you, when uh, other farmers, white farmers, would come to my uncle's farm, and my, my, father, my father, uncle was a very good farmer, and they come to him for advice early evening, they send me to the house because I was that Yankee boy <laughs> from up north that was staying down there on their farm for the summer. Yeah. And they would be afraid that I would say something flip that would create problems for them much greater than those two months that I was down there staying with them on the yes, farm. Sir. So <laughs> there, there are consequences of that that I tried to never let them experience. But I didn't realize that until I got older just how much of a consequence that could have been for them. 
Yeah, I think, uh, I mean, something's been a running theme in my life right now, especially the dynamic of me and my mother is um, as I've become a, a full adult, you know, as I like to joke with my son, I'm a big boy now, you know, you, your parents start to share with you details of past parts of your family that um, when you were 15 or 16, they'd be like, you know, go in the house, go over there. And now they're like, well, actually what was happening then was this, 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 and this, and these other factors. And um, it's something to the importance of um, getting appropriate, something you said earlier around appropriate um, information, I think it was that you said, or appropriate um, uh, freedom, I think it was. One of those, we'll come back to it. Or you mm-hmm. listen to the tape. It'll, 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 it'll punch it to me in a minute. Um, when you think about uh, coming up in what Philadelphia and how Philadelphia was, as you as a young man, what do you think, is there something that is maybe inappropriate that we're letting happen with young people? Or I don't know if let is the right word, but it's happening with the way we're transferring information to our young right now um, in, in the Philadelphia context, maybe not in the both world context. Well, one of them, I guess, is that there, in certain communities, there's a disconnect of respect. Mm-hmm. There's a disrespect of older black men who I I talk about it many times, who by the age of 40, who have not realized their dreams Mm. or they have buried their own dreams for a family, Mm -hmm. that they're very discontented with themselves and they lose respect for themselves. Mm. Um, Many of them, and I've seen it in my life, become alcoholics. They may never leave their families, but they are never happy with themselves because they've never been able to realize their dreams and their thoughts and their aspirations of their life. Consequently, um, a lot of their children don't respect them because they don't understand them. Mm -hmm. And some of it because they lose respect for themselves. Um, Younger people don't respect elders and they don't young a lot of younger black men have a very big problem taking instructions from black men that being because they're being raised by women women usually are who young men uh, young family members go to for their mom to bail them out after they've done something horrible Mm -hmm. um and so they don't want to hear they, they reject it when the police come at them. They don't come a certain way. That's why black men who know talk about, and some women now you hear them say, have to have that conversation with their children on how to react when the police come upon them, mm-hmm. on how not to aggravate a situation that's already negative. I'm just going to give you an example. When, when Majestic was in high school, mm-hmm. I was bringing them to the University of Pittsburgh one morning for, to visit the school. And son's coming up, and he'd been on the road with me traveling north and south, so he knew about traveling the car, and he tells me, hey, man, you need to slow down. We almost there. But I'm rolling. I'm listening to music. I got him and two other guys. That I'm, we're, we're just four of us in the car, and we're in a Cadillac, and we're going to Pittsburgh for a visit. He said, man, you need to slow down. Well, I didn't slow down, and we come over a hill, and the state police is sitting right there. State police come to the car and see four black men in the car. Mm -hmm. And the first thing he do is flip the strap on his gun on the highway on the Pennsylvania Turnpike. Mm -hmm. And I stick my hands out the car and say, no, no, officer. It's not like that. One of the guys whose father was an FBI agent was sitting in the back and sitting on his hands. The state policeman felt threatened. But I'm hollering, no, no. And, well, when the whole thing winds up, mm-hmm. I don't have my drive, I don't have my owner's card signed. <laughs> you know what I mean? So I'm in violation of the law. Mm-hmm. But the officer saw it. He came back to the car. He said, here's your stuff. Mr. Lane, sign your owner's card. You, young man, when the officer comes to your car, don't you never sit on your hands like that. You'll make him feel threatened and something else is happening. Because I'm telling, I'm taking these kids to the University of Pittsburgh mm-hmm. for a visit. Uh, he winds up telling us, 
Enjoy your visit to, 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 to Pittsburgh, young man. I hope y'all decide to go to the University of Pitt. That could have wound up on the highway being a much different situation. Mm-hmm. Much different as the sun is coming up in the morning. So I say that to say how having those type of conversations mm-hmm. on how you conduct yourself with authorities or, or your movements with authorities is a whole nother thing. I've had situations where me and my nephew have been on the highway and officers pull us over and we've had this happen a number of times between Philadelphia and Durham, North Carolina. You got any drugs or guns in the car? No, we don't. Some of them had got other calls and then had to drive off. Mm-hmm. <laughs> other ones, I start talking and talking to the officers say, no, you get back in the car, go ahead, before my partner gets here. I keep right on over rapping. He said, go, get out of here. <laughs> when we go and come back, because we're going to pick up someone from a train station, yeah. he has somebody else in the same place where he pulled us over and off the highway with all of their luggage out the car, the guy laying face down on the ground. Mm. Learning how to deal with authorities, learning how to talk to them, learning how to diffuse a situation which you have no control over. When you're on the highway, the police is the only one there with a gun. Mm -hmm. You can make a bad situation worse, or you can make a bad situation just play itself out. So how you control yourself, those conversations, those things you share with other young black men to try to explain to them Mm -hmm. what's going on is something different. I've gone to schools and told them, I know who you are. Somebody in your family at Thanksgiving was unhappy and snatched the tablecloth off. All the dinner went on the floor because they mad with somebody in the family Mm -hmm. at Thanksgiving dinner. A lot of negative things go down when families come together on Thanksgiving. Mm -hmm. Somebody stole all of the toys from out underneath the Christmas tree and went and sold them because they was on crack. Your grandfather, your grandmother is alcoholic. Your mother or father may be on crack. I know who you are, but that has nothing to do with you. That has nothing to do with who you decide to be in your life and what you decide to do with your life. So I try to give it to young black people as honest as I possibly can. And when you start talking to them like that, they listen Mm -hmm. because you've hit a note because it may not be their, their immediate family, but it's some family they know that those things you're saying has happened to. Absolutely. Absolutely. Man. Is that the end of the third question? We still got some more stuff. Come on, man. Come nah, on. man. We, we you, actually, got me, you got me going we, now. Come on, come, going, on, come, we, on, we, come we on, come on, come on. We almost got to land a plane. Come on. Uh, <laughs> so actually, I, I, I will um, get, you, get you out on two questions. One, one quick one. Okay. As long as you make it. You got, you got the tennis shirt on. All right. Oh yeah. All right now, something you may may not know. You know, part of something that early on me and Majestic bonded over was was talking about you know his his experience actually playing tennis. Me being the son of a, 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 a person of a man who's a great tennis player, and um, having uh, entree to the tennis world and the sports right um, in that specifically world. Is there something? How or what? Where did you kind of get exposed? As because I people sometimes assume with black people we don't know nothing about tennis or, mm-hmm. but of certain generations, yeah, you know I mean folks, and then I think also even coming out of probably coming out of Durham, I'm, I'm making some assumptions. You let me know if I'm on the right track. Um, you may have been exposed to the world of tennis via um, other relationships or, 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 or social connections. What is something? Um, even just about non-traditional or sports that aren't tend to be associated with our community, is there something that you think is an opportunity for learning um, that is there that maybe we don't access? Well, I didn't come into tennis until later in my life. Okay. I ran track. I'm a gold medal winner in the pin relays, which you know is only recognized as second to been an Olympic or World Games winner. Indeed. So I ran track. I say. Uh, it was all state in football. Yes. And I set the bench on the varsity basketball team. Mm. So I was involved in three different sports as I came up. I realized that sports is a very important character builder. Okay. Um, that was very important to me, exposing my son, not to the sports that I play, but to sports in general and letting that be something that be an important character builder for him. Um, he played, he ran track, 
you know what I mean? Was a quarter miler, which was something that I could have never done. Um, I did that one <laughs> once. I can't do that he, either. He, he, he played tennis. Mm-hmm. He played competitive tennis, although it was never an aspiration that he was going to be a professional tennis player, but it builds character. Mm-hmm. And he's played basketball in the Sunny Hill Basketball League. All those were character builders. All those taught him different ways of you find out what your niche is through sports for different things that you want to do. Um, my exposure to tennis came when friends of mine, when I graduated from college, and they moved to the Caribbean. They moved to St. Thomas and Virgin Islands. And they started scuba diving <laughs> and uh, playing tennis. And I got the tennis book from them. And then it took off. I used to be at the University of Pennsylvania until the lights got turned out in the summertime, mm. hitting balls, playing balls. My legs hurt. Till learning the game. Had some older black people who played tennis at some of the black private tennis clubs in Philadelphia that took me under their wing and let me know how to play. Tennis can be a very snobbish game Mm -hmm. because it's an individual sport, and people tend not to want to play with you. I wound up being with some older black people who would say, come on, come on, Twinkie, let me show you how to do this. Mm -hmm. And when I stopped hitting balls over the fence all the time, (laughs) then I was able to play with them. I was able to play doubles with them because they'd show me how to position myself, and all you want to do is get the ball back. Well, then it allowed me to later on uh, give my son the experience of taking lessons at the University of Pennsylvania. From that, he grew to be a ball server for one of the people who was taught by Dr. Johnson, who was the same person that had Arthur Ashe and Althea Gibson underneath them. And your father. Yes, sir. So he... Became he took lessons from him, uh, Donald Ringo, mm-hmm. and then he became a ball server for him. So I didn't have to absorb the high price of tennis lessons. <laughs> he was working some of it off <laughs> by being a ball server. Later on, he became got a job working at Temple University um, as being a person to help with the uh, what was it, NCAA uh, a program for youth youth mm-hmm. through tennis. So. It's not for you to become a professional player, but there's growth and there's opportunities for you within those different sports. Mm -hmm. So those people, so I just came from the ATA, the American Tennis Association, their 101st uh, national championship in Orlando, Florida. Mm -hmm. So I go every year um, and experience that with African Americans. And now you say your father, who was taught by Dr. Johnson and them, Mm -hmm. um, and experience those things with them. Tennis is a sport that teaches individuality. It teaches you character. Um, I guess one of the first bumps me and my son ever had when he raised up against me (laughs) was we were at a tournament in the Northeast, and he's playing some kids, and he's going off on the court, and I'm motioning to him from up there, yo, yo, what's wrong with you? What's wrong? You don't act like that. And then when, when there's a break, he said, man, you talking to me? They cheating. The mother was giving the son signals <laughs> to beat him because it's very important to yeah. them not to lose to us. Yeah. I didn't see that, and I realized that, and I recognized that. And that that also moved me and him into another realm of our relationship mm-hmm. because he also understood, and I understood, that there's not honesty with all people, even within sports. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so he, one time, then he wound up being part of the Dr. J tennis tournament where Dr. J, uh, they had uh, fun with a serious purpose yeah. through the Urban League of Philadelphia. Um, and the, the, the person who designed that program just recently, I attended his funeral last week, uh, Robert Sorrell, who created that opportunity with uh, Julia Serving and, and those people back then, that he became a part of that whole system. And he started going on uh, to tournaments up and down the East Coast with that system. So then he started traveling, traveling, running track, traveling, playing tennis, because it builds character. And that's why I think it's important for young people to be involved in that. But I didn't know that about your father. We'll have to talk about this after this. Yeah, Yeah, absolutely. So I'm going to get you out on it. Um, So I usually go, um, what's a, either some music, uh, a song or artist, something that you've enjoyed that maybe, um, you would pass along or you would say to others if you you need an enjoyable musical experience, what would you want to make sure that they took a time to tune into or listen to? 
Stevie Wonder, okay. when is the last time you told someone, I love you? And he talks about that in that song, I know of a man, a family that doesn't have a cent to their name, but the love they have re- between them will always remain. When they're called from above, there's one thing that's the same. They can say that they gave their best, very best in their all. Three words, smart and simple. Three words, short and kind. Mm-hmm. And those words are, I love you. Thank you. Thank Dwayne, you. Appreciate you. Appreciate you. Peace. Thank you for listening to the Ash Your Old Head podcast with Justice Raji. Thank you to my guest, Larry Lane. Thank you for traveling with us down here in Durham where this interview was recorded. Thank you for uh, contributing um, all that you have to my life over these uh, years that we've uh, been connected. Um, you know, in the truest sense of making sure that you give people their roses while, you, while, you, while you're with them. You know, please consider your roses past and uh, hopefully I will have the opportunity to give you some more uh, in the near future. Thank you to uh, the folks at the Black Communities Conference, uh, which I was attending at the time of this recording. It was a really, really great experience. I'm so honored to be able to be on the panel and share uh, some of the work that I do and some of the crossover with the work that my good brothers do. Uh, Thank you to the city of Durham for being a, a great host and being an opportunity to reconnect with a part of even my own family history um, in the region right there in the Raleigh Durham uh, Greensboro area. Uh, thank you to you, listener. Thank you to my family. Uh, thank you to everyone out there that's uh, doing the best they can for those they care most about. New episodes will be coming and continuing in the next week. Also, be on the lookout for uh, some additional interviews and a, and a sit down with a dear friend of mine around uh, and previous guests on the show as we talk politics in an upcoming episode that will be out before the end of the month. So, um, thank you to the listeners. Thank you to Kappa Consulting. And with that, we're going to exit and say peace. <laughs>